And the congregation said? Amen. Amen. The congregation is a little shorter right here than it normally is, but uh, I'm glad that you've joined us today. And I want to add my happy Mother's Day to you, mothers. I really appreciate Jeremy's prayer and uh, thinking of the mothers and noting the things that he did about them and uh, all of us as husbands and sons and daughters we want to uh, echo those sentiments to our mothers if they're still alive and certainly to our wives if we're married um, and the children uh, who are in the audience you need to tell your mother today happy mother's day and how much tell them a reason give them a reason something that they do for you that uh, you really deeply appreciate. Take the time to do that today. So happy Mother's Day, even though it's a little bit offbeat from uh, our normal celebrations, then it can be something really special if we'll uh, just simply take the time to call or to uh, let our mothers know uh, how much we value them and appreciate them and love them. I have to take a moment and tell you how uh, I don't, guess I can say how my day started, but something that happened uh, last night, sometime in the uh, deep hours of darkness, I woke up. And I didn't know what woke me up, and, and you know it takes a moment or two for your brain to wake up after your eyes do, but I realized that there was a noise in my bedroom that was unusual. And my brain, I lay there without moving because as my eyes opened up, I saw shadows in my bedroom that were moving. Shadows on the ceiling, shadows on the wall. Uh, there was someone, something in my bedroom that wasn't supposed to be there. And uh, if you can imagine waking up like that, all of a sudden I could hear my heart thumping, okay? And I didn't want to move because I wanted to try to determine wh who or what it was in my bedroom before I moved because I knew when I moved I needed to move fast. And so I lay there trying to recollect any, anything in my memory that would tell me what this was. And it kept moving, and it was moving closer to me. I could tell the sound. And then it dawned on me. We have one of these uh, robot, uh, what do you call them, vacuum cleaners? And it had, I guess it knew it was Mother's Day, so it wanted to give Janice a, a Mother's Day gift, so it woke itself up and had made its, its way into our bedroom and was vacuuming the floor in our bedroom. And it has a blue light on it that was blinking. And so, uh, I, you know, when I finally realized what it was and my heart calmed down a little bit, well, I had to get up and go get the remote and uh, lead it back to its station where it was supposed to be. And when I got back and got in bed, it was exactly 12 o'clock. So I, my day started out kind of interestingly, all right? And it takes a little while to go back to sleep after your heart get to, gets to thumping that hard, you know, after a little while. But anyway, so uh, Mother's Day started out with an interesting little scenario for us there. In fact, when we uh, woke up this morning and got up, Janice said, did I dream last night that the vacuum cleaner was here? And I said, no, you didn't dream it. It, was, it happened. So uh, happy Mother's Day. I have to admit to you that I've been a little bit uh, in a quandary over what I should be preaching during this really special time, this time when we're separated. Uh, and it's compounded a little bit because I don't have the opportunity to read the body language of people in the congregation because uh, that, that helps me to know whether I'm getting across or whether what I'm preaching is uh, being effective or it's not. And just FYI, as far as I know, in our congregation of a few over 800 individuals, we have had one person who has been diagnosed with the coronavirus. And that one person 
uh, it appears, has survived that, and we're extremely thankful for that here at Woodland Oaks. But other than those who have been directly impacted medically by the virus, there's one group of individuals that I want to express uh, my sadness for, that I'm really sorry, and that's high school seniors. You've been robbed. And I just think of all the things that should be happening in your life right now and graduation and all the celebration that goes with it and the joy of completing these 12 years of school and you've been anticipating this and particularly maybe if you were in sports like baseball or soccer or something and you're looking forward to your senior year and, and uh, you got robbed. I just want you to know that I, I'm really sorry I can't help it, but I, I'm, I'm sad for you. And uh, uh, I, I hope that uh, as time goes on, you'll look back on this and uh, it won't be as sad as it must feel right now to you. So uh, as well as uh, Happy Mother's Day, I just want to say congratulations to you graduates also. All right? Uh, I may be wrong. I, I think I have been wrong at least one time in my life, but I want to believe that Christians are far more capable of handling this crisis without becoming depressed or discouraged than the average folks out there. Those of us who are familiar with the Bible are able to put our current situation into a historical perspective that's guided by the realization that God is, in fact, in control of human affairs. We have dozens of examples, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, that demonstrate that God has never abandoned his people, even in what appears to be the very darkest hours. I don't pretend to know why this is happening. Is God causing it, or is God allowing it? I don't know. I do know that on numerous occasions, God has brought drought and plagues and hostile foreign military powers against nations because those nations have chosen to abandon their trust in God. Am I saying that that's the cause of this current situation? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I wouldn't completely discount it, but then I'm not able to say that I know that that's why this is happening. But this is why I have chosen to continue this study about faith, because I see it as a unique opportunity for us to grow our faith. And because of my faith, I'm not depressed and I'm not discouraged. And I'm not questioning God. I don't have to know why this is happening. God doesn't have to answer to me, and he doesn't have to answer to you. He's God, and you're not. As we said last week, he is the potter, I'm the clay. I'm confident that God is still in control. And so if you want to take away from this lesson that you can remember for this week that I hope will help you navigate all of this stuff, Here's a line for you, a line I want you to take away from this lesson. Faith is still trusting God when you don't have the answers. Faith is still trusting God when you don't have the answers. And I, I find it really interesting. I don't know if you've noticed this or not, probably not like I have because I was anticipating knowing what I, I was going to speak on. But Dave in his class earlier made the statement, it's okay for us to not understand everything. I appreciate that, Dave, because we're thinking on the same line. And then Jeremy, in his prayer, said, we don't have to know the why because we know the who. And I appreciate that. And so we talk about God's Holy Spirit working. You know, I'm not going to presuppose anything, but it seems like there's a thread. You know, we're all thinking along the same lines here. I learned some stuff from our friend Job. And I want to read a section of scripture right here uh, that really struck me as being pertinent 
to just kind of get our minds lifted up out of the, the, the mire of these present circumstances and to get a broader picture of things. And I, I'm going to be reading from Job chapter 12, and it'll be take me about a minute or a minute and 20 seconds or so to read this, but I want to read this, and I want you to listen to it. And this is Job speaking. To God belongs wisdom and power. Counsel and understanding are his. What he tears down cannot be rebuilt. The man he imprisons cannot be released. If he holds back the waters, there's drought. If he lets them loose, they devastate the land. To him belongs strength and victory. Both deceived and the deceiver are his. He leads counselors away, stripped, and makes fools of judges. He takes off the shackles put on by kings and ties loincloth around their waist. He leads priests away, stripped, and overthrows men long established. He silences the lips of trusted advisors and takes away the discernment of the elders. He pours contempt on nobles and disarms the mighty. He reveals the deep things of darkness and brings deep shadows into the light. He makes nations great and destroys them. He enlarges nations and disperses them. He deprives the leaders of the earth of their reason. He sends them wandering through the trackless waste. They grope in darkness with no light, and he makes them stagger like drunkards. That's Job chapter 12, verse 13 through 25. And Job, having said all this, and extolling the power and the virtue and the control that God exercises over the entire earth, not just one nation of people, but everybody on the whole entire earth, in the middle of all of this, and sitting on top of an ash heap, having lost in a single day all of his sons, all of his daughters, all of his possessions, and now his body is racked with sores and pains, and he's sitting on top of an ash heap, and he's got a piece of broken pottery in his hand, and, he, and he's scraping his wounds. And sitting there, looking out over those ten graves of his children, he says, though he slay me, still will I trust in him. Job thirteen fifteen. Job could not have known why these horrible things were happening to him. His friends, however, were all confident that they knew, and they were quick to verbalize it. But they could not have been more wrong. And you know what? If they had all known why this was happening, they wouldn't have understood it. And if they had known why it was happening, they certainly wouldn't have liked it. God is God. I'm not. And you're not. And so Job, along with many others who have trusted in God through the ages, did not have the answer to the why of his current circumstances. But Job and everyone else who's walked by faith through the, through the years teach us we don't have to have the answers in order to trust God. God has given us more than sufficient reason to trust him in every single situation. And you know, everything that the Bible has to say about faith comes down to one simple principle. God wants you and me to trust him. That's it. That what, that's what faith is all about. He wants us to trust him. Everything in the Bible is about trusting God or the consequences of not trusting him. That's the two things that everything, two categories, that everything in the Bible falls under one of those two categories. God wants you to trust him and he's giving you reason an example so that you will trust him or he's telling you what's going to happen if you don't trust him. And he gives us example after example of that. In Hebrews chapter 11, and we keep going back, I keep going back to 
Hebrews chapter 11 because that's our chapter on faith, isn't it? In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 and 2, and we should be familiar with that. Now, faith is what the ancients were commended for. Now, in verse 1, he starts out, now faith is, and he gives a definition. And then he says, that's what the ancients were commended for. I want to pick a little word out right here and maybe put a little bit of different twist on it for you. The word commended. Now, faith. It's what the ancients, the men of old, that word's actually presbyteros, the, the older men. That's what they were commended for. And the Greek word for the word commended is, the anglicized way of saying it is martyros. We get the word martyr from it. This is what the ancients were martyr, martyros. And the word originally means a witness or someone who bears witness to, somebody who testifies to the truthfulness of something. And later, over a period of time, that word came to be someone who testified unto death, martyr. But it originally didn't mean unto death. It was just somebody who was a witness who stood up and testified about the truthfulness of something. And so being a martyr, meaning somebody who died, is not the original meaning of the word, and it's not primarily the way that it's used in the New Testament. It's primarily used to say somebody who's a witness. So the text would literally say, now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients bore witness to. This is what they testified to. What, did, what was it that they testified to? What was it that they bore witness to? That faith is being sure of what we hope for and being convinced or certain of what we do not see. That's what they stand up and bear witness to. This is what faith really is. And they are examples of... Their witness is an example to us that that's exactly what faith is. And if you think about that, and we've been thinking about it for the last few weeks, when we talk about what we hope for and what we do not see, that's talking about the future. And that's what faith is all about. And so they each are saying, as they stand up and testify in Hebrews 11 and throughout the Bible, they're saying, I can personally testify that this is true. This is what faith is, and this is what faith does. It gives me the conviction, the certainty about my future. And that's what they're all saying. And that's what Hebrews chapter 11, when it gives that list of people, they're all saying. After listing in Hebrews chapter 11, 16 specific men and women of faith plus an indefinite number of saints who were persecuted or killed for their faith, then the writer ends the chapter with this. And let's put our new definition to commended for here. Verse 39, the end of chapter 11. These all bore witness through their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. What did they bear witness to? What faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. And so here's our takeaway. People who have faith are sure of our future. That's what it says. People who have faith are sure about our future. And let me tell you something. If you're sure about your future, you can handle whatever happens right now. You can fight a bear with a switch if you can see light at the end of the tunnel and if it's really real, if it's not a train, right, coming down the tunnel. And so if we know that God's taking care of our future for us, we can bear whatever happens. And that's exactly what these people bear witness to. They went under, they, they did, they had to endure some horrific things. And particularly if you look at the last part of that chapter, it said that they were, there were those who were sawn asunder, the King James Version said. They were cut in two for their faith. They were beheaded. They were put in prison. They wandered around in caves. They didn't have enough to eat. They didn't have enough food. They endured some horrible things. How could they endure things like that? 
And how could they endure things like that and still remain faithful? Because they were secure in their future. They knew what was going to happen to them when they died. So if you know what's going to happen to you when you die, you know that God's going to take care of you, why would you fear what man can do unto you? He can't do anything to you that can rob you. People can take away your money. They can, they can you know, banks can fail. Uh, houses can rot. Cars can rust. People can steal from you. You, you know, loved ones can die, but people cannot touch your relationship to God unless you let them. And so we're secure in our faith. Hebrews chapter 11 is a list of witnesses. They witness to the blessing that come to those who live by faith. But the Bible is also replete with examples of people who demonstrate the results of those who reject faith in God. We can begin with Adam and Eve. What caused their problem? They listened to the wrong person, didn't they? They listened to someone other than God. And how'd that work out for them? Boy, when we leave them, they're not in too good shape, are they? How about Cain and Abel? What was the difference between those two brothers? You remember Cain killed his brother because of jealousy and anger. You know, we don't really know the specific details of Abel's, why Abel's sacrifice was more acceptable, was acceptable to God when Cain's wasn't. But here's what we do know from Hebrews chapter 11. It says, by faith, Abel offered a better sacrifice than Cain did, Hebrews 11:4. And so the difference was that one sacrifice was offered as a demonstration of faith and the other one was not. I don't know the intricacies or the details of what made it acceptable or didn't, but I know the underlying cause. One of them was offered as a demonstration of trust in God, and the other one wasn't. And that's what made the difference. And as we continue in our Bible reading, we encounter some who live by faith and some who didn't. And the Hebrew writer in chapter 11 gives us some who did live by faith and what the outcome of their life was, what the blessing, the benefit was. And he begins, I don't know if you've put this together in Hebrews 11 or not, but he begins with the creation of the world in verse 3. And he talks about that just because you can't see something doesn't mean it's not real. The earth, the, everything that was created was created from something that did not exist prior to that. And that's what he's, the way he starts this out, about faith. So it's about things we can't see. And the world was created from things we can't see. But is it real? Of course it is. And so that's the way he starts out. And then he begins to talk about how that faith, how people fit into this thing about faith. And he begins chronologically listing those in the Old Testament who lived by faith. There was. He didn't have Adam and Eve, did he? They couldn't be listed as somebody who lived by faith. But guess who the first one is? Abel. Abel. He's the first one listed in Hebrews chapter 11. And that's in Genesis chapter 4. And then there's Enoch in chapter 5. And then there's Noah in Genesis 6. And then there's Abraham in Genesis 12. And then there's Isaac in Genesis 25. And Jacob in Genesis 27. And Joseph in Genesis 37. And Moses in Exodus chapter 2. And he continues on with Rahab and the judges and the kings and the prophets. But there were other people in this Old Testament story that did not trust God. They rejected God's instructions. And they did their own thing. And we've already mentioned Adam and Eve and how things turned out for them and consequently for us because of their sin. And there was Cain and there was Esau and there was Lot and there was King Saul. And there were all of the kings of Israel beginning with Jeroboam. They didn't make this list of those who bore witness to their faith and to a person. I want you to notice how their lives turned out. We need to learn something, not only from those who walk by faith and the blessings that they got, but from those who rejected that faith. 
They did their own thing. They didn't listen to God. They listened to somebody else. Maybe it was themselves. They did what they wanted to do. And I want you to notice how their lives turned out. And the only difference between them is the righteous will live by faith. They bear witness to what happens to those who don't live by faith. And we need, we must learn a lesson from them as well as those who did walk by faith. You see, back to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. And I've been on verse 6, I know, for quite a bit of time. And it's because I believe that this verse is the heart of the requirements of faith. Hebrews eleven six. I believe it's the heart of what God wants from us. I know that we've spent a considerable amount of time on this verse, but the more you dig, the more you realize that there's more down there. And you just need to keep digging. And it begins with the dramatic statement. It says, without faith, it is what? Impossible to please God, right? And then it tells you why that's true. Because... Without faith, it's not possible to please God because he's going to tell you why. Anyone who comes to him must believe two things, that he exists and that he rewards those that dil diligently or earnestly seek him. And we went through that last time. We saw that in our, in, in our prior lesson, that those are the two pillars that faith is, is built on. Now, I hope you're following me right now because I want to ask you a question that's going to require a little bit of deduction on your part. First, the writer tells us that it's impossible to please God if we don't have faith, right? And then he tells us why. And this is the why. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Now, I want you... And I wish we were in a Bible class right now so we could have a discussion about this so that everybody could reason to this for themselves. I want you to tell me how that explains why it is impossible to please God without faith. It's impossible to please God without faith because he that comes to him must believe two things. So if you're going to give this back to somebody, you're teaching somebody, you're teaching your teenage child, and you're teaching them, how is this an explanation of why it's impossible to please God without faith? And I would suggest to you that the answer is because if you don't have faith, you won't come to him. I think that's the key. If you don't have faith, and in order to have faith, you have to believe those two things. And so, obviously, if you don't believe those two things, you don't have faith. And if you don't have faith, you're not going to come to him. But you see, the key in what God wants out of all of this, what pleases him, is God wants us to trust him for everything we need, all the time, in every circumstance. He wants us to come to him and not go somewhere else but come to him. Now, we may have to go somewhere else like to the bank or something after that, whatever, but we need to come to him and we need to trust him that he's going to provide us with what we need. He wants us to trust him for all of our physical needs. Why was it that God in the form of man came to this earth to demonstrate his power? Why did he heal the blind and the cripple and the disease? Why did he calm the raging seas? Why did he feed the hungry? Why did he raise the dead? Because he wanted you and me to see that he's in control of everything in this universe. Why? Because he wants you to trust him. Because he wants you, you have to know that he's bigger than everything and anything that can happen to you in this world whether it's disease, whether it's a storm, whether it's being blind, whether it's you don't have enough food, whatever it is, he wants you to come to him. Why was it, do you suppose, that he touched 
the leper's repulsive flesh before he healed him. Remember that story? Jesus reached out and touched him. I don't know if you've ever seen a leper or not. I happen to have been to a leper colony and have seen advanced leprosy. And the idea of reaching out and touching those sores, touching that diseased skin, makes your skin crawl. But Jesus reached out and touched him before he healed, knowing he was going to heal him. Why did he take little children on his lap and whenever disciples tried to shoo them away, he jumped on them? Why was it, do you suppose, that as he stood in front of Lazarus' tomb and he saw the sisters and the friends of Lazarus crying, that the Bible says he cried? Why? He knew he was going to raise him from the dead, but he took the time to cry. Why? Because he wants you to know that he cares about you personally, individually. He cares about what you're going through. He loves you, and he wants you to trust him. He wants you to know that he cares and that he loves you so that you will come to him. And he obviously wants us to trust him to supply all of our spiritual needs. And while that may be obvious, I'm not sure is quite as obvious as we might think. And the point that I want to make right here is don't trust in your own righteousness. Righteousness is imputed. It is a gift from God. It's not something that you earn. We humans have this love affair with law. And I think I know why. Two reasons. Because if righteousness comes by my being good and by keeping law, then everything's under my control. And I don't have to depend on anybody. I can row my own boat. I don't have to go anywhere. I can keep law. And because to the degree that I do that, I can take pride in my righteousness and how good I am, and I can feel superior to other people. We have this love affair with law. Even though law works wrath, we still love it. And it's amazing how much of the New Testament was written to encourage people, don't go back to law for your righteousness. Go to Jesus. Go to God. They have made provision for your righteousness Listen to what Paul lamented about his own ethnic family. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they might be saved. For I can testify about them that they are zealous for God, but their zeal is not according to knowledge. And then he explains exactly what he's talking about. Since they did not know about the righteousness that comes from God and went about to establish their own righteousness, they did not submit to God's righteousness. God's righteousness was here. Their righteousness through law was here. They chose this one right here. And then he says... Christ is the end of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who has, guess what? Faith. There may be righteousness for everyone who has faith. Now, does that help you understand what he means when he says in Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it's God's power unto salvation to everyone who has faith. Remember that word pistis? A lot of versions said everyone who believes, same exact word, everyone who has faith. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, from faith unto faith, just as it's written, by faith the righteous will live. And you know where he says right here, for in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, from faith unto faith? He could have said, in the gospel, a righteousness is revealed from faith unto faith unto faith unto faith unto faith unto faith. Because that's what he's saying. Our righteousness is all about faith from beginning to end. Without faith, 
it's impossible to please God. Did you know that? You know why? Because without faith, you won't come to him. You'll go somewhere else, anywhere else. And the Bible says, lean not to your own understanding. But whenever we read, it, don't you find it true that often when you read something that God tells us to do, there's this voice in the back of our mind that's saying, hmm, I don't know about that. Boy, that doesn't seem right to me. It just seems to me like if I did this, then that things would be a lot better. And how many people follow that, that voice, that gut feeling we have, rather than trusting God, particularly when it doesn't make sense to us what God tells us to do? But you know those people that live by faith, like Noah? What did it take for him to get up and go build that ridiculous boat in his backyard every day? He just kept on and kept on, didn't he? You think that made sense to him? How about Abraham offering his son? Did that make sense to him? That's why they were men of faith, because they trusted what God said more than what sounds reasonable to me. Listen to these verses. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Matthew 6, 33. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Philippians 4, 6. And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. Philippians 4, 19. The lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord need no good thing. Psalm 34, 10. He who did not spare his own son, but freely gave him up for us all, how shall he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Romans 8, 32. You see, that's what God wants from you and me. He wants us to trust him totally, completely. He wants you and me to come to him for everything we need. That's what faith is. We don't have to have all the answers. In fact, we're not going to have the answers. In fact, we won't, might not even like the answers if we got them. And if we did get the answer, there'd be another why behind it, wouldn't it? And if we got that answer, there'd be another why behind it. And so we're going to die with questions, right? So don't be so impressed with yourself that you have these intelligent questions that can't be answered. Everybody has questions that we don't have answers to. But faith, we lean on our faith. We're guided by our faith. Trust him. Has he given you reason? Has he given you evidence that, that would cause you to trust him? Listen to him. Follow what he says. You know, sometimes God's got to wake us up. I don't know that he wakes us up with a vacuum cleaner in the bedroom, but he's got to wake us up. And this thing that's going on right now in the world is kind of a wake up, is it not? And he needs to remind us that we're not in control. He's in control. This is a classic opportunity for you and for me to grow our faith. To listen to what God says. And are we going to be frustrated and angry and whatever else comes along with not knowing why this is all happening? Are we going to trust in God? If you know what your future is, if you know that he's taking care of what's going to happen to you after you die. You can handle anything that happens in this world. And you can be at peace with it. Are you confident? Let's, let's, let me just boil it down to this one question for you, and I'll leave the lesson with you. Today, right now, the way you've been acting here the last month or so, are you confident about your future? Thank you. God bless you until we meet again.